get started. All right, welcome everyone to the Matrix Conversations and Transformations, a webinar series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice. I'm Professor Mary Christianakis, and I am joined by my co-organizer of the series, uh, Professor Malik Moazam Dolat, and our department chair, Caroline Heldman, uh, couldn't be here today with us. Uh, this event's, event is also co-sponsored by the California Immigration Semester, and I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Richard Mora of Sociology. First, a bit about the series. The series focuses on press and current events and seeks to connect our community with experts, scholars, artists, and the most effective activists. This fall semester, we're running a series on all things immigration. It's a busy time for the matrix. Just a heads up, Wednesday, November 4th at noon, my esteemed colleague, department chair and world renowned scholar, Professor Caroline Heldman will discuss the election. This Friday at 9.45 a.m., we will also host Dr. Oliver Wang, who will discuss cultural and culinary hybridity. You can register for the upcoming events and access our YouTube channel where you can watch videos of past events at oxy.edu slash matrix. We're also on Instagram and Twitter at CTSJ Oxy for both. And now my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Emir Estrada, who earned her doctorate and master's in sociology from the University of Southern California, right here in LA in 2012. She received her bachelor's in sociology with a minor in Chicano studies from the University of California, Los Angeles, my alma mater. And she is also a proud Long Beach City College alumni. Estrada was, Professor Estrada is a qualitative immigration scholar interested in the migration and cooperation and aspects of immigrants from Latin America. Her research interests on in immigration and gender influenced in great, are influenced in great part by her own immigration experience. She is currently investigating three lines of research that share a common theme centered on Latino families and decision and the decision-making process. Estrada is, Professor Estrada is also affiliated faculty member of the School of Transborder Studies and the School of uh, Social Transformation in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU. Today, she's here to discuss her book, Kids at Work, Latinx Families Selling Food on the Streets of Los Angeles. Professor Estrada, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's always an honor to uh, be invited and to share um, uh, about my book. So this is the book that I that I will be discussing today. Uh, but I, I like to start my presentations with a very important question. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's the title of my book. Feel free to follow me on social media where I share information about where I will be speaking and other in events. But I'd like to start with a, with a general question and um, maybe if we can put like a one in the chat. Let me see how I can figure out how to look at the chat. Uh, well, we'll use the Q&A. Okay, yes. so if you can put a one in the chat and the Q&A, if you have ever, oh, how do I, okay. Eaten a delicious hot dog from a street vendor. So if I can see uh, those of you that are, uh, let me see, where is the Q&A? All right, only one, come on, nobody, okay, good. Yeah. Jacob, I see Liz, awesome, awesome. How about a corn on the cob? Can, I, can you put a two in the chat if you've ever eaten a delicious corn on the cob from a street vendor? A two, a two, can I see more? Okay, you guys are starting to warm up. How about pupusas, delicious pupusas? Please put a three in the chat if you've ever eaten pupusas from street vendors. <laughs> you guys are from LA, right? Like you, I should be, okay, good, good. <laughs> Tamales? Not enough? everyone is from LA. They're all actually all over the world. They're all over the yeah, world. Okay, yeah. well, then you guys have to come to LA. This is, if anything, this should be an invitation to bring you to Los Angeles. Um, so put a four in the chat if you've ever had tamales from street vendors. Am I making you guys hungry? It is that time of the day, right? Uh, a little, and I should see a five or a thousand. Put a thousand if you've ever had tacos from a street vendor, please, a thousand. No? Let me see, who has had tacos? Yes, yes. <laughs> Over, yes, that's a million list. <laughs> um, well, I don't study for per se, right? Like, so my work is not about street vending food, 
but I study the families that make and sell the these types of cultural foods in the streets of Los Angeles. Uh, and I have a specific focus on the role of children, right? I focus on what is the role the children play in the family economy, right? What, are, what role do they play in how food is, is sold? What kind of food is made? Uh, where is the food uh, going to be uh, sold? Uh, so that I found that the children do have a lot of decision-making power within the family business. But that was that is the focus and the main um, topic that I discuss in Kids at Work. I want to look at their agency in this type of family uh, work environment. Um, so why study street vendors? So just to tell you a little bit of, of, of background of why I became interested in this topic, um, and for those of you that are just joining in, I am, uh, I do have the company of my little Yorkie who thinks he's a lion. So if he starts barking, I may excuse myself and take him outside. Um, and Max is really good. He's a, he's a good dog, but, but Ben is, it can be a little mischievous. Um, so why study street vending? Um, that actually is not an idea that originated when I started grad school, right? Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about my background. I am originally from Zacatecas, Mexico. Um, do you guys, let me see, like put, a, put a, a, a seven in the chat if you have ever been to Zacatecas. I'm curious to see um, if anybody has been to Zacatecas, no? Well, that's another place that you wanna visit. Um, I grew up in Zacatecas. I was born in the US, but my parents decided to move back to Zacatecas when I was a little baby, um, like less than a year. And uh, that's where I grew up. That's where my, um, best memories are and uh, we relocated to the U.S. when I was 18 year, years old so after I graduated high school. Um, this is a picture of me in my house in our house in Mexico. This is a picture of me in, in, in the, um, middle school uh, and um, it's a, a typical picture where you have the book and the um, um, and the flags world flags uh, at the, I believe that's in the third grade. Um, I like the uh, like I was introduced. I went to LBCC, UCLA, and then I received my PhD from from USC. But I've always worked with my family. I've always worked with my with my mom in Mexico. We had a little store where I was always part of the of the family business. And when we came to the U.S., my mom started cleaning houses. Uh, we actually came to the U.S. Uh, because my dad passed away, and uh, we had a economic dependency in the uh, to the U.S. And we decided to relocate, immigrate to the U.S. and work here as well. Um, my mom was a teacher back home, but she couldn't um, teach in the U.S. because she didn't speak English. Uh, although she was a, a, a um, she could legally enter the U.S., but she she didn't have the uh, the skills to get a, a job equivalent to the job that she had back home. So I cleaned houses with her for for a period of time. Um, and again, I've always worked to make ends meet. Um, when I was at UCLA, I read a book by, uh, by Pierrette Handegnius Otelo that talked about my mom's experience, and that really caught my attention. It really made me um, be more critical about, you know, the experience that my mom was having in the U.S., and, uh, but I also saw that my experience wasn't uh, written about, right? What about the children who work with their parents? Um, and at ASU, I teach classes where I focus on uh, talking about the uh, I want my students to uh, really tap into own and talk about their own immigration story. And I do this through art. Um, and I wanna share this because uh, one time we had a speaker uh, come to our class um, and um, you probably know him, he's uh, Ramiro. He is from uh, Los Angeles, Ramiro Gomez. And he is very well known for painting um, immigrant workers on cardboard and places these images on places where immigrants work. And his goal is to bring visibility to invisible workers. Um, and in this image, you see him painting a woman. Um, and when I asked him uh, about this image, he said, I, I always paint this woman. Like she always comes to mind. I've always been painting her. And I think it's because it reminds me of my mom and, and um, when she used to clean houses. Um, and then she shared, he shared a story and he said, um, that um, Picasso was once at, at, at a coffee shop and he drew this image on a, on a napkin, right? And um, someone who saw him draw this asked him, 
I would like to buy that from you. Can I, can I buy it? And he said, he gave a, a ridiculous amount. Like, yes, you can buy it for $5,000, right? A drawing on a napkin. And the person who inquired about the painting said, are you crazy? I just saw you draw it and it took you less than five minutes to draw this, right? And Picasso replied, um, it actually has taken my entire lifetime to create this drawing, right? So that really captivated my attention and it, it helped me understand how the book that I also wrote, um, that it's not something that originated at, um, you know, when I started grad school, it actually originated much earlier because in this book, I tell the stories of immigrant families who come to the US. Um, I tell the stories of immigrant families who work together to make a living together. I tell the stories of immigrant families with a focus on the role of children. So again, this story is pretty much um, also um, uh, a story that, that is very close to my heart uh, and where I do see a lot of the um, um, re relation to, to, to my personal immigration story. Uh, so I encourage all of you who are watching and um, perhaps you are you know, thinking of something that you wanna research, really tap into something that matters to you, something that's really important and something that you want to um, perhaps investigate a little bit deeper. Like, um, like I did when I was a student at UCLA where I saw my mom's story, but I didn't see my story being told. So in Kids at Work, that's what I do. So this is the uh, cover of the picture. Uh, my friend took this picture during one of my um, field observations, um, and this is the the uh, index or the content uh, table of content um, from the book. Uh, the research questions that I ask in this book are the following: So, what are the social conditions uh, that these families encounter in the U.S. that enable them or constrain them to street ban? Right. Uh, it's important to look uh, from a sociological perspective, uh, what were the conditions already in place in the US that made them possible for them to street bend? The second one is what are the role that children play in the street bending family? This is really important because I wanted to see, um, again, how is it that they made sense of their own work? I didn't wanna ask parents about their children's experience or teachers, I wanted to be I wanted this project to be very child centered and I wanted to ask them directly to talk about how they started street vending, how is it that they experienced street vending, what do they like or dislike about street vending, um, and other questions that I asked in, in the uh, throughout my, my research. Um, I was also interested in asking about um, how does this work relationship alter parent child relations right so now that the children are working with their parents. What does that mean for intergenerational family dynamics? Um, and the other one is how do immigrant families navigate um, integration into the US when work places them so publicly and visibly in opposition to the country's laws and social expectations, right? So these families are doing a work that one, it's, um, it was legal during the time of my research. Um, there are cultural expectations of what children should be doing, right? And a lot of the parents that I interviewed were undocumented um, during my time, the time of my research. So again, they have a lot of uh, uh, against them, especially being in such public settings, right? So again, um, some of the study implications, as I mentioned, street vending was illegal during the time, and they were doing this place, this type of work in a very public setting, right? The streets where they're exposed to customers, urban traffic, immigrant xenophobia, racism government officials such as the police, health inspectors, social workers, and for three years, a very annoying sociologist like myself, right, that I was there asking them questions and being intrigued about their uh, everyday life experiences. Um, so in um, the street vending falls in the realm of in the informal economy, right, and the informal economy uh, in Los Angeles is uh, thriving. Um, there are um, 289,000 informal workers in Los Angeles County, and 61% of them are informal, uh, are undocumented immigrants. Uh, now, this is very important to note because the majority of the people that resort to street vending, they do so not as a, an original plan, right? Um, I, I have one chapter dedicated in my book where I talk about 
uh, the first generation uh, street vendors that I interview, their intentions were not to come to the US and become street vendors, right? They kind of defaulted to being and doing this type of work because they encountered blocked opportunities in other um, aspects, in other, in other uh, work environments. A lot of them do enjoy being street vendors because they have autonomy, because they are their own bosses and because um, they, they enjoy the freedom and actually do better than if they were to work uh, for someone else. So those are some of the findings and some of the the, uh, the feedback that I got from from my from the people that I interviewed. Um, it is estimated that there are about 50,000 street vendors in Los Angeles. Um, and again, that's difficult to quantify specifically because of the informal uh, nature of the work. But a lot of them, again, are children. Um, and that's why my, my work seeks to to highlight the voices of these children, and not only the adult vendors. Um, so we have elections coming up and um, the elections uh, from uh, 2016 really uh, changed the landscape of street vendors um, in, um, in California because as Trump was elected, um, the city moved to decriminalize street vending. And the reason for that is because um, street vendors were at the mercy of police officers who, who could detain them because they were street vending, right? Um, again, not without any wor uh, working permits. Um, so the city moved to decriminalize street vending as a way of protecting its more vulnerable um, members. Uh, and in 2018, um, Senator Ricardo Lara uh, uh, championed Senate Bill 946 that helped uh, create a pathway to uh, help uh, street vendors obtain a, a legal work permit. That's still in the works and has been halted because of the pandemic. So um, actually street vendors have been uh, struggling during the last um, few months, like all of us, but specifically them because they, again, they do this type of work in a very public setting uh, where um, the, the, the move that has been uh, done towards legalizing street vendor and giving them work permits has been um, in a way halted for a second. So um, when I started my research, I started reading about street vending and everywhere I looked, it talked about street vendors as the first generation immigrants, right? And some of the reasons that they cited as why they were street vending was because um, of the reasons that I highlighted already, they um, didn't speak English. They were blocked from uh, working in other places of the economy uh, because they were undocumented and street vending, um, allow them for, for a creative option to make a living, right? Um, when the literature talked about children, it talked the, about them in a very passive way, in ways that uh, families would bring their children to work with them, especially women, would bring their children to work with them because of a childcare strategy, right? So I, I cite here Hamilton and Chinchilla, which uh, talk about children in that regard. And that is also something that I saw when I was conducting my research. I definitely saw women who, um, would bring their little ones uh, to work with them because they didn't have elsewhere to leave their children, right? But that is not all I saw. I also saw children making a conscious decision of helping their parents because as I write in my book, uh, the children would see how difficult it was to make a living and they saw it as a way of being mutually protective and um, uh, mutually protective uh, in terms of helping their parents and the parents uh, helping them as well. So um, in the book, I hired their ag agency and how they decide to work, right? So um, these are some of the faces of the children that I interviewed. Um, again, they'd helped anywhere from cooking the food before they left the house the night before or the morning of. They helped by preparing the food while they were on the streets. They helped by carrying uh, crates of orange, like you see here. Uh, one of my respondents, um, you know, carrying the, the uh, crates of orange so that the little sister uh, could, could make the, the freshly squeezed uh, orange juice. My research took place in Los Angeles, California and have this map here just to kind of um, set the contextualize where the research took place. At the time I was a student at USC. So um, it took me, you know, on a good day, uh, uh, 20 minutes to get to my research site. On a bad day, um, 100 hours to get to my research site. Everything is is uh, relative in Los Angeles, right? Depending on traffic. 
Um, but that's where, and this blue area, that's where my research uh, took place uh, in Boyle Heights uh, in East LA. But I also interview families in other parts in Santa Ana, in Riverside, in Long Beach. Um, so that's where I started. And depending on who they recommended uh, through snowball sampling, I was able to reach out um, and expand my, my field site uh, to, other, to families who worked in other, other places, uh, like Southgate as well. Uh, but the majority of my observations in the site that I talk about, um, that I call La Cumbrita in El Callejón, took place in this area right here um, by the 101, the 10, and the 60 in East Los Angeles. Um, I interviewed both parents and, and, and youth, and I wanted to make sure that I included both because, um, again, I wanted to focus on the youth, but soon I became uh, interested in also understanding the experience of the parents, right? Because I was interested in how the dynamics change between parent and children after they started working together. So my sample included 32 girls and 11 boys. Uh, and the majority of them, as you can see here, were US citizens and 10 were undocumented. So this is a very important finding because um, one of the concepts that I, that I will talk about in the future, which is uh, economic empathy, uh, directly connects with the, um, the US citizen as, as, a, as a status that they use to protect not only themselves, but their family as well. All of them were in school and th three of them were in private uh, paid education, uh, private uh, schooling. Uh, and they contributed every day, anywhere from $45 to $150 a day through their sales. Um, so in total, I, uh, I interviewed uh, 15 families and I also included uh, five families as a comparison. So these are five families that did not street bend with, the, with uh, the, where, where families had children and the children were not involved in the family business at all. Now I decided to include this because um, during my presentations, I, became, I, I, I would hear the uh, comments like this, right? Oh, um, Latino families work together because of their culture. They enjoy working together, right? Or, um, so I wanted to be very clear that, or not to use culture as an explanation for why these families work together. And a way that I uh, did that was I included, a, again, a comparison, comparison sample uh, group where uh, street vendors also had children, uh, but the children were not involved in the family business at all. They did not work. Um, I uh, predominantly use a semi-structured interview guide. I ask questions about their work, their family business, the household, the school, uh, and I also conducted observations. So I conducted participant observation at the street. I did home visits. Um, I did in-depth shadowing with five families for at two months uh, each. And I also went to any social events that they would allow me to, including holiday parties, hospital visits. I went to church with them. Uh, street vending meetings. Uh, I went to one funeral. Um, and again, anything that they were um, open to having me around, I made sure to make myself available. And I would go uh, with them and conduct their observations at these um, social settings. Um, I asked the children to give me a sense of their, their, their day. And I, I gave them a, a schedule similar to this one. Well, actually, this is a, a copy from, from one of, of the children that I interviewed. And as you can see, all of them were in school and they help their parents after school and on weekends, right? So here you have the, the, the youth who's telling me school the whole week and then helps uh, at home. And then on Friday, to Saturday and Sunday, they sell at the park or they sell with mom um, on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and according to her, they make about $200 every time they sell together. So again, this is very common for, for the youth um, to do. Um, here we have another one. They went to school. They were in an after school program. They would sell at the park. And then um, uh, she, she had a, a job um, outside of home. So she worked at downtown as well. Um, so I, I want to highlight one of the, the concepts that I, that, I, that I write about in the book, and, which is economic empathy. So economic empathy. Um, is a, a, a theme that emerged uh, during my time in the field. So uh, this is how it sounds like. I'm gonna read you a quote um, and, and then I will, uh, let me move this chat here. 
Um, so when I asked children if they, you know, what they did with their money or if they got paid, um, a lot of them actually didn't get paid for their work, right? Um, they, they did this type of work because they really wanted to help their parents uh, because they saw that there was a need in the, in the family and because they saw that how much, what a difference it made when they were um, involved in the family business. Um, so um, Nilda told me this about um, their kids and, and, and this is how I grounded or I, I talked about economic empathy. Nilda said, my daughter is living what I am doing. She knows, for example, Leticia knows that I get tickets, citations about the police, having to work in the rain, the water, everything. All of my kids also know about this, but they don't live it. My relationship with Leticia is more of an attachment, a pegamento. What happens is that she's a girl and I have more trust, confianza in her for everything. And with my sons, we talk less. They are less attached to me. Why? For the same reasons. They don't interact, conviven with me. So again, uh, working side by side with their parents enabled the youth to really be familiar with what was happening when they were street vending, right? Here, Nila talks, she knows about the police. She knows when I have to street vend and it's raining or when it's very sunny and I have to still be outside and, and getting um, sunburned uh, in order to make a living. So the children developed this economic empathy towards their parents because again, they knew how difficult it was to do this type of work that was not only um, seen as foreign, um, but also uh, it was racialized and, and gendered. Um, Clara, uh, this is from a child's perspective. This is how she, um, you know, described the experience of working with her parents and how I coded this in the concept of economic empathy. Clara said, and she's, she was 14, she said, I would like people to come here and see that it's not easy. We see my mom suffer. I see friends that don't do anything. They go shopping and tell them, dude, while you're shopping, I'm working my ass off here. All, a lot of people make fun of my mom or me, but if they only knew, then they would be saying, don't buy me this, don't buy me that. I think my relationship with my mother is very special. So here I wanna highlight that because children knew how difficult it was to earn the money that they did working with their parents, they also restrained themselves from asking for unnecessary material things, right? Um, we live in a world where, where um, we uh, of, of a consumer culture. And this doesn't mean that the children didn't want the latest iPod. That, that was when, when the shuffle was, was in style or the latest iPhone or video games uh, or tennis shoes or the, you know, the latest um, uh, jeans that they wanted to buy. Um, it didn't mean that these children were, um, you know, uh, didn't want these material goods. Uh, they did, but they constrained themselves or didn't ask for these material goods, again, because they knew how difficult it was for them to earn the money to buy that. So again, this is this is what I what I coin as economic e empathy that is um, tied to the relationship of working together side by side with the parents, right? Um, as someone who has a 14 year old daughter, um, I, I, this is a, a concept that I that I really, really hope to teach to my daughter. <laughs> no, she's really good. Um, so um, another thing that I found and I highlight in this book is um, the children's aspirations. So um, I talked about what they want to do when they when they um, would grow up or after you know what they wanted to study or major in. And um, a lot of them really saw themselves as majoring or being something in life that would enable them to give back to their community. So I saw this and I, I call this a collectivist immigrant bargain, where it wasn't just that they wanted to go to school to give back to their immediate family, but they wanted to go to school and be, um, I found that a lot of them wanted to be cops and, and attorneys because they wanted to be uh, a, a form of support or representation, not only for their immediate family, but for their community. Um, so Alejandro, age 14, um, said this uh, during my interview. He said that he wanted to be a police officer and he said that he wasn't gonna be like those types of cops. I mean, I'm not gonna see how it, uh, I'm gonna see how it, it is. Uh, 
Like if it's something dumb, like why am I going to bother them if they're not even doing anything? I'm going to be chasing the guys that are killing people. How are they going to stop somebody who is not doing anything? And here he's reflecting and talking about people like um, her, his mom who street vends. Yeah, I understand they street vendors are not supposed to be here because of the fire and all of that. But I mean, if you know they are not really doing anything, if they are trying to make a profit the same way everyone else is, why bother them? Right. So here, um, Alejandro talked about wanting to be a police officer, but not bothering the street vendors. Right. And during my time in the field, that was that was a real uh, danger for them because the street, the, the city of Los Angeles was very aggressively pushing street vendors from um, the, the more common street vending sites. And um, when I originally started doing uh, interviews and conducting observations, um, I could easily find 80 street vendors uh, on any given weekend um, on, on one street. And over time, they were basically moved from that street vending site and they were spread all over the city. So that came with problems because um, being in one site offered protection for street vendors, right? So it created this uh, street open street vending markets, but it also provided protection for uh, for the street vendors. Um, later, I started following the families who would be selling from more isolated corners, more isolated um, uh, streets, and and of course that uh, made them more vulnerable to um, gangs and 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 theft. Um, Amalia said this about, um, so here to show the, the mom's perspective, Amalia said this about a collective, collectivist immigrant bargain. Amalia was very involved in the community and, and um, she said this about her son. I have always said to him, like I have been many injustices, I have seen many injustices with the police here in the community. And in reality, we do need legal representation. At first, my son told me that he wanted to be a lawyer. And then he said, no, I don't just want to be a lawyer. I want to be a judge. So again, this is the, 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 the moms and the, uh, the parents and the, the children talking about their future investment, not only to give back to the family, right? As um, scholars have written in terms of, a, of an immigrant bargain, uh, but uh, seeing more of how it's important for the youth to go to school and get an education so that they can give back to the community as well. Um, I also want to talk about um, uh, Josefina's story. And um, this is a story that I, I'll, I'll close with. Um, Josefina was 17 when I interviewed her and she was getting ready to graduate. And as most uh, seniors, they had to put together a resume for their um, for for their graduation, um, it was one of the requirements. So I sat with her and I helped her with with um, put together her resume. Um, I brought my computer. I opened my computer and I was typing. I was asking her questions. And when we got to the job section uh, or employment, um, she said, "I don't have any experience." Um, she had been working with her parents since she was five, street vending. Um, and selling different types of things in Los Angeles. So I looked at her and I said, Josefina, what do you mean you don't have any work experience? You've been working with your parents since you were five. Um, she looked at me and she said, and what am I gonna say that I'm a street vendor? So it really made me think about, you know, the context of illegality and how many of the youth that I interview have real tangible skills, but they remain invisible in documents like a resume that really help them um, you know, get into uh, schools or uh, find an internship or find a job, right? So there's formal ways of documenting uh, one's um, experience. And here we have a group of kids who have work ethic, who have learned, again, to be empathetic with their parents, who um, are learning math skills while they're on the streets, who learn how to prioritize being and working with the family over spending time with friends. Um, who are very mature, um, but then again, these skills are very uh, invisible um, in, in, in common ways that we tend to uh, document these uh, achievements or skills. So um, I have more stories of Josefina. She, she was ama she's amazing and I can perhaps use an opportunity during the Q&A to ask, uh, answer and, and share more about her story. Um, but I would like to end there and give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. 
And um, and then I can during the Q and A, I'm happy to share more more um, anecdotes and stories from my respondents. Thank you so much, Professor Estrada. I'd like you. at this point to open up the Q and A while we uh, ask our questions, and we'll invite you in as soon as we see your questions. Professor Mora, did you want to start us off? Yes, uh, Professor Estrada, while we wait for other questions, um, you mentioned that there was a, um, a race and gendered element to your findings. Could you, could you, could you expand on that a little bit? Yes, so um, a lot of the youth that I, that I interviewed, they were told uh, to go back to Mexico when they were street vending. So um, they were street vending with their families, they were making tejuino or pozole or you, you name it. Um, and um, they were frequently told, go back to Mexico, you don't belong here. So these, uh, as you saw, the majority of them were born in the US. The majority of them, all they knew was, was, was uh, the US. Yet, because they were doing this type of work in a very public setting, in a type of work that's seen as Mexican or foreign, they were told or they were automatically othered, right? So this is something that they had to counter uh, on a daily basis. Um, it was also gendered. I actually found that more girls street vend than boys. And um, I don't know why I, I was surprised. I, I thought because it's a, it's a work that's done on the streets, I was gonna find more boys uh, street vending. Uh, and, um, I actually found that girls were more um, uh, willing to help their parents um, and for sev several reasons that I mentioned in the book. One, they were seen as cleaner, right? They were seen as, as um, they would sell more because they are less threatening um, to the customers. Um, one of my respondents said uh, she had brothers who were not involved in the street vending business and she sold tejuino with um, her dad and mom and she said, look, this is a very like isolated strip. Imagine just if a guy is sitting here, who's gonna stop by in, in the middle of nowhere and buy tequino from a random guy, right? So having the presence of girls um, in these types of settings made it more of like a family uh, or, or less threatening uh, place uh, for customers to stop by on the side of the road and, and get um, buy tequino in this example. Um, and moms also brought their daughters to work with them more than they did sons because they felt um, they felt better leaving the, the, the sons unaccompanied while they felt that they needed to protect their daughters uh, and keep them closer to them during the day. So for example, I found that um, the, the boys that I interviewed, they would go to the gym or the park or with the girlfriends while the boys, the, the, the girls that I interviewed, they were constrained to working longer hours because they had to be close with their, with their mothers, right? So um, those would be the, the that's what I, I discuss in, in, this, in this book. I also have a chapter on, on the dangers that that resulted because there were unintended consequences attached to this, right? Because while the families develop strategies to protect their daughters, they left their sons um, with less protection that ended up um, hurting them because um, while they were given the freedom to roam around the streets or hang out with friends or even sell by themselves, uh, they were bullied by other peers. They were attacked by gang members in the area. So several of them were actually stabbed and sent to Mexico to recuperate uh, while I was in the field. And that's something that I didn't find with the, with the girls that I, that I interviewed. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A, but before I get to those, if I could just follow up, um, just for clarification, um, the people that were um, attacking attacking these young folks and the people that were bullying them, were most of them also, also um, Latinx folks? Yes. So um, they, um, again, they street vended in, in East Los Angeles where the majority of the population is um, Latinx. I believe it's like 90% of the population is Latinx. So they, they mostly interacted with other uh, co-ethnics, right? Um, now, um, again, this goes into the, the powerful, the power of stereotypes, right? And how this occupation was seen as foreign as other. Um, some of the, the kids that I interview were in pub public education, private education. Um, and when they were in school, they didn't talk about what they did because they were embarrassed about, you know, 
uh, talking about street being street vendors or making a living as street vendors. Um, and although their peers were also Latinx, um, they they kept that from from their their peers because they would get bullied um, or may, may laugh that right. Um, the, for example, I have um, I opened with Marta in, in the book, and she said that. Um, you know, how can she tell her classmates that she was a street vendor when they were fresitas and their parents literally worked for them and gave them everything, right? Uh, when I asked them, did you, do you invite your, your friends over for sleepovers? And they would look at me like, uh, no, because then they would know what I do for a living, right? Because it was very evident that you would see the merchandise at home, you would see the uh, you know, stacks of soda and corn on the cob and etc. So they really try to keep that part of their life private and secret. Um, and um, the boys, again, they were um, the boy that I, the, in this in this case that I talk about being being stabbed. Um, he was frequently uh, teased and um, called Tejuino boy. They were like, oh, Tejuino boy. They would make fun of him. Um, and uh, one day he just you know, uh, uh, stood up to himself, got into a fight, and and ended up getting getting uh, stabbed. Um, so, so yes. Okay, so we have we have numerous questions in the in the yes. Q and A. So I'm going to start off with the first one. Um, I was wondering how gentrification has played a role in both criminalizing street vending and pushing vendors out of a specific location. For example, like the Arts District in downtown LA. Yeah, so th that's a really, really good question. Um, um, even recently, I mean, I, I see, oh, what was the name of, uh, of this Gringos Tacos or something like, some of, of, of the same activities that have been done by Latinx street vendors are uh, romanticized when, um, um, you know, a white uh, individual uh, resorts to this occupation, right? Um, I, I don't remember the exact, the exact, um, I, I think it was like Ringo's Tacos. I'm not, I'm not exactly, it's a, a, a chef that was laid off and decided to start street vending tacos on the street. And he received a lot of media attention. Um, there was a report on LA Times and, you know, uh, they really romanticized his entrepreneurship, right? So it's interesting how the same activities are, se are seen different when done by brown bodies, right? In this case, uh, Latinx, um, individuals. Um, so I do, I do want to uh, uh, say that I, I've been um, out of the field for some time since 2012, and a lot has changed, right? So there's a, a new books that have come out by Rocio Rosales and Liana uh, from UCLA that look at more um, at new development in, uh, in street vending markets. So uh, yes, that definitely does have a, an impact. Uh, one of the things that I talk about my in my book is is um, the this idea of foodies or well that's not an idea uh, it's uh, how the types of food that that my that their street vendors uh, sold was seen as as um, as authentic food culturally authentic food and how they um, foodies would would type. And, and talk about in, in blogs about this types of cultural food that was authentic. And the, the youth in my sample really uh, use that as an opportunity to promote their, their, their food stand, their, their, their food, um, uh, their food. So they would actually use uh, Twitter and Facebook and um, use those comments by foodies that were not Latinx um, uh, customers to kind of promote and, and sell to uh, non-traditional customers. So that ties back to your previous question, Dr. Mora, whether um, I know the question was about the aggression part of it, but I did find that a lot of the customers were not also Latinx customers, right? Um, because um, of these reasons that of the foodie culture and how uh, these were seen as, as authentic um, markets. We're going to continue on with the next question. Um, could you talk a bit more about working with youth in your research, especially with young children um, and more difficult topics? How do you go about your interviews and interactions with uh, with such vulnerable populations? Very good. So um, I decided to to start interviewing at from ten to eighteen, and 
at first I thought maybe younger, right? And um, I decided to to interview from 10 because of those reasons, because I, I did focus on, on, on interviews and um, it was dif more difficult to interview younger, um, younger kids. Um, and it, it, was, it was challenging because they would get bored. So I always share, the, with, share this story with my students because I had this um, one little girl, Nancy, and we were at the park. She had been street vending for a while. I met her and her mom. And, um, you know, we, we put up a chair and I'm, I'm across the, the table from her and I'm asking her questions. And then she starts putting her head down and she starts like, you know, kind of falling asleep. And my first response is like, oh, pobrecita, she's probably tired. Poor little girl, right? She's tired. So I asked her, Amiha, are you tired? Are you sleepy? And she says, I'm just bored. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, uh, I was very interested in her responses, but again, she was like, oh my gosh, I've been talking to this lady for 15 minutes. I'm done with her, right? <laughs> so some of these interviews were short and um, we took breaks and then I, I, I went back and I interviewed them. So um, this is certainly the type of work where your ego shouldn't get in the way because <laughs> kids will tell you what they, what they think. Um, but this complemented with the family observations and also the uh, participant observation, I think was very, powerful because it, I was able to triangulate uh, what the kids told me with what I saw, with what the parents said to me, and also being uh, at home during downtime, right? So for example, uh, the families that I followed, I, uh, I would, would be home with them as they prepare dinner. So I was able to see who prepares dinner, right? I was able to see, um, for example, I talk about a family who, um, as I'm talking to the parents, um, two of the girls start making uh, lunch without being told or instructed. They just start making lunch and the young boy starts running errands and buying the oranges that they'll need for their next day, day of street vending. Uh, and everybody knows what to do. And then they start setting the table, we eat together. And um, so again, the, the division of labor in the household was very, uh, was very gendered as well. Um, where the girls not only did more work outside of the house, but they also, um, again, had uh, more expectations of what to do um, at home as well. So that's something that I also talk about in the book of, of the extra responsibilities that girls had to do at home that um, were assigned because of, of, um, of, of, of them being, being las mujercitas de la casa, right, the girls at home. And it doesn't mean that they didn't challenge that. They, they did talk about complaining and they complain and they challenge that, but they also saw the benefits of what their work gave them, like uh, opportunity to leave the house, make a little bit of money, uh, and also this bargaining power, but they were able to ask for more things if they worked versus if they didn't. If, if I can ask a, a follow-up question to that in terms of just um, research, right, and the methods. Um, and the vulnerability of not only the young people, but but the uh, the parents, given given uh, for those who were undocumented, right? Given their status, um, how did how did you manage that? How did you think about, um, for example, even some even documenting, let's say, in pictures, right? Um, who did you choose? Did, were you mindful of choosing folk uh, of picturing young folks, say, for your cover, right? Who who were um, who were themselves, docu uh, say, U.S. born and, and thinking about their parents' um, status? Of course. So um, that was one of the challenges of, of um, getting uh, respondents uh, early on because mm -hmm. just getting IRB approval took me several months. Uh, I would say even maybe four months to get IRB approval because that's, of the- uh, human for, those, for students, that's human subject approval. It's approval you need, um, you get from an, uh, a body at the at the university, a committee that uh, prior to doing research, you can we we as faculty members can cannot initiate research without the approval of a, of a of a committee of a board. Yes, thank you so much for for uh, clarifying that um, acronym. So the institutional review board uh, took me, um, you know. Uh, it, it, it took about four months to, to get it approved, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, and yes, um, I required additional consents for, to use the images, for example, that I use for my book. Um, I also used the photo voice project where, where I gave youth the uh, cameras for them to take pictures of their environment. 
um, and I made sure not to use any pictures where uh, the parents were um, were uh, photographed. Um, so I had I um, the reason why it was so difficult to gain their consent was because after I you know would explain what my project was about and they would say yes, I needed a um, consent form from the parents from the youth. And it just felt like they were buying a house, like right? here's this form, here's this form, here's this form. And many of them would be intimidated by, by the, the number of, of consent form and assent forms that I needed in order to conduct my research. But um, I'm grateful that I had to do that because it, you know, it gave participants the opportunity to, to decline. So when I explained to them the project and I, and, um, I translated all the documents in Spanish um, and I wrote them in a way that it was uh, reader friendly. So I, I read that to my mom and I said, Entiendes lo que estoy diciendo. So I made sure that my mom would be able to understand. Uh, so I try not to use academic language. Um, so because it was important for me to, that they um, that they knew what I, you know, what I was doing. So um, what else? Um, did I answer your question or is there something that you want? No, 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 absolutely. Um, if I can just follow up with, um, on that before we get into the other questions, um, you know, given the fact that some of these some of these young folks get bullied and made fun of and such, um, what was the reaction of the of the of the young folks on the cover to them to them being on the cover of your book? Um, so when I I reach out to them and I made this decision to um, to use this picture um, towards the end of the of the book right um, so I, I had decisions to make I do I use a, a, a stock photo and it just didn't feel right it didn't feel right to to make up a picture right and uh, when I talked to these families, um, I, I spent several uh, time with, uh, you know, some time with, with these families and I really got to know them. And when I explained to them what I would be using for, they were really excited and they were happy to, to do that. Um, I did make sure to select the picture where her features were not very visible. Um, this picture was taken um, over 10 years ago. So she's a, she's a young woman now. Uh, so again, my research took place in 2009 to 12. So this picture, you know, she's now 10 years older, right? Um, so um, again, she excited to see the picture. I'm sorry. Is she excited to see the picture on the cover. Yes, yeah. yes, and I and I um, I I've had opportunities to go back and and talk to um, the people that I interviewed, and I've given them a copy of the book. Um, so they've, they've received the book, uh, in a very positive way. That's great. So we're going to move on to, uh, we have a few more questions. Um, how do, um, here's the question. How do youth use their legal status to protect themselves and their family? Yeah. So, um, I didn't ask questions about citizenship. That's something that actually came up. So in my interview guide, I did not ask, are you a US citizen or not? When I talked about their immigration, I asked them questions about their immigration story, right? And in that story, that's when they um, shared part of how they immigrated to the US. Um, so for the youth, the, the, I talk about uh, American generational resources. And one of them is citizenship and how I see citizenship or I saw how they use their own citizenship as a protection, a protective mechanism, not only for themselves, but for their family. So for example, um, a 14 year old that um, would tell at El, El Callejon, um, I saw her several times when a police officer would drive by that she would uh, kind of take control over the, the stand, right? Like she would, she would be more present and the mom would walk away. Um, I noticed that, and then during my interview, I asked her, and she said, um, she said, what's the worst that can happen to me? The worst that can happen to me is they gave me a citation, but my mom, she can get deported, right? So for children who were part of mixed status families, their fear was always the worst, right? What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is I can be separated from my parents because they can get deported, right? So I did see children as using their own legal status as a way of protecting their family members, and, and again, in a very vulnerable setting, right, the streets. Um, so um, this was a surprise finding because again, I didn't ask specifically, like, are you a US citizen? Where were you born? But um, 
it was something that they that they revealed um, and uh, and um, and how they they used it. I you know you always see citizenship, but now there's a growing body of literature literature with uh, DACA youth, for example, where we see. Um, how families share those different resources, but for me at this time it was it was a surprise to see that you know citizenship is not something that you just benefit from directly, but again it's, it can be uh, a protection for for the entire family. Um, some of them also drove, so at the time you couldn't uh, have a driver's license in California, so some of them were able to, especially the older kids, were able to legally drive in in, in California and um, move the family to different uh, student vending sites, right? So that was another way that, that they um, benefited the family directly. So yes, at the time, at the time uh, if you were undocumented, you could not um, obtain a California license, right? And now you can. Mm -hmm. So here's another question about protection in some ways. Um, it says, how, how, do, how did the families protect themselves from theft or racism? Um, so, Uh, the the families saw in in many ways um, the presence of women on the streets served as a protection mechanism. For example, um, the the young boy that I told you that got got uh, stabbed once. Um, I was in the field. It was it was uh, late at night, and uh, the mom sells pancakes. Um, and then I see this young boy uh, go to the uh, McDonald's that was around the uh, around the corner to buy coffee. And he tells his mom, okay, I'm gonna go get coffee. He starts walking away. I can see uh, the mom getting stressed and because the son is leaving. And that's because um, a few months ago, he was attacked by local gang members. And um, um, so he, she, she looked around and she sent a little girl that she was taking care of and a five-year-old girl and said, go with, go with, um, with Armando. And the little girl starts running, grabs Armando's hand, and then they walk together to, to the local McDonald's. Um, I asked her why she did that. And she said that if they see, if anybody sees him with, with, with a baby, he's safer. So I found it interesting that even the presence of a small girl uh, could offer uh, a protection for a male uh, in the streets. Uh, another uh, father that I interviewed, he said um, that he was street vent with his wife. And he said, I pushed the um, uh, cart of, of raspados and my wife pushes the stroller because if they see me with my wife, it, you know, I, I won't get um, bullied or I won't get um, uh, attacked or I won't get my, my money taken away. So again, the presence of a woman on the street was seen as a protection mechanism. There was another presence where um, uh, older street vendor is selling with her son um, and they're stopped by a, a, a local, um, well, I don't know if it's a, a gang member in, in the area. And um, he asked him to come over. And he says, do you know this is, and then says the name of the, of the gang territory. And um, he acts like he doesn't know. He's like, well, I, I didn't know. He's like, well, you know that, you know, you may have to pay, you know, a fee to work here. And he acts like he doesn't know. The mom gets really nervous and he yells across the street and he says, just dale lo que quieras, give him whatever he wants. You know, the mom is really stressed. Um, to this, the gang member responds, um, Doñita, don't worry, like I'll let you guys go this time. But again, here's another example where the role of an uh, older woman in this setting um, helped appease the situation, right? So the moms did advise the, the son specifically not to fight back not to stand up for themselves. Um, so this was a, a, a blow to their masculinity, masculinity in, in great regards because even when they were approached by their peers, they were asked to buy their mother specifically to just um, take the high road, not to respond back in order to avoid fights, right? So in the book, I do document many examples of where both the moms or the spouses, the wives, or even young girls um, help to protect uh, the men who, who are street vending. So there's this paradox of the street being safer, more appropriate for men, where in this context, um, I saw that it, that, that, um, it wasn't that necessarily. So it sort of really sort of challenges that public sphere, private sphere dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes. So it, it really does put that. Um, and again, it challenged my own assumptions and expectations because I expected to find more men street vending and I actually found more women. And in the context, as, as, um, as I said in the presentation, um, street vending sites offer protection, right? Because when I was conducting my, I even felt safer when I was uh, like at one in the morning doing observation, making, uh, you know, participating. Uh, because it felt like it was like a live open mercado, like open marketplace, where there were about 80 different street vendors, right? Um, there were lights, there were sounds, there was music, there was food. Um, but around 2009, 2010, uh, street vendors were uh, dispersed and kicked out of uh, and harassed from that street vending site. So that offered less social protection from other street vendors, right? So in a way, um, I'm hoping that these new uh, pathways to um, legalize street vending uh, enable for those types of sites to exist again because they're safer for um, not only women but also for men, right? So that's something that, that we need to highlight and for the children as well. So there's a question that's uh, in some ways related to that. So with that one, it says, um, was there any type of convivio between the children who helped their parents in street vending um, and did that help create a sense of community in those spaces? It sounds like, it sounds from what you're saying that there was some kind of sense of community that was, uh, that existed between, um, between the different vendors and their families? Oh, definitely. So um, it wasn't, I, I am very careful of not to romanticize um, their work, right? Because uh, there was certainly competition, right? So in the book, I talk about, um, there's nothing, informal about informal economy, right? Um, you might walk the street and be and say, this is just a street, right? But for street vendors from this line to this street, that's their site, right? And from this corner to this corner, that's where they they, they have their, 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 their street vending um, post, right? Um, so um, there was informal agreement, right? Of, of, of their own um, physical spaces. Um, and they also, um, like, I remember going to a Halloween party where the street vendors dressed uh, in um, the theme of El Chavo del Ocho, La Vecindad. Uh, and these are uh, very popular characters, not only in Mexico, but in South America and even here in the US. Uh, so different street vendors dressed in, um, they coordinated and they dressed as La Doña Florinda, El Chavo del Ocho, La Chilindrina. So uh, all these different characters. Um, and I went with them to a party and, and it was, um, it was really fun, and again, it showed yeah, um, how they convivian or how they spend time outside of these street vending uh, sites. Um, something else that it's important to highlight and um, is that a lot of these street vendors learn how to street vend once they came to the U.S., right? And in the book, I have these examples uh, of, of a couple who, when they started making um, tamales, for example, they said, you know, I didn't know how to cook before coming to the US. I didn't know how to make tamales when I came to the US. Uh, and here we started like experimenting and we narrowed it down to three different types of sauce, uh, salsas that the customers liked. And we focus on those and that's what we've been street vending, you know, and, and selling. Um, I have another um, um, dad who used to work installing carpets and then worked at a furniture uh, store and he was very badly treated by his um, boss. One day he quit, he went to his compadre's house, his friend's house and said, you know, okay, I'm ready. I want you to teach me how to street vent because I, I can't take the, the abuse that I'm getting from my boss anymore. So again, um, he had to learn how to make the, the, the syrup for the raspados, uh, build his own cart, right? Uh, paint it, learn what routes to take, what routes to avoid, how to street vent. So again, this is not, um, Professor um, uh, Hernandez Leon at UCLA writes about skills of the unskilled. And it's important to highlight that uh, street vending is not an unskilled occupation, right? This actually takes a lot of learning and a lot of skills uh, to, to be uh, successful in, in this type of business. We're gonna have to be wrapping up, so, um... If I can ask you this question that seems seems like a good way to end, it says, um, is, is there anything you'd wish or recommend for us to do in terms of how we can contribute to the safety and rights of vendors? Um, I, I do offer that in, in towards the end of the of the of the book in the conclusion. And 
what the youth wanted to know is 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 um, they wanted to share their experience, right? They wanted to know that it's not easy to do what they do. Um, um, uh, I also want to highlight that the book that I wrote is not just about street vendors, but it's about families that work together. And I conclude the book by highlighting other occupations where children are also involved in this type of work with their parents and what that means for the family and the family uh, intergenerational dynamics. So it's important to recognize those things and kind of see ourselves in, in other people's stories. Um, for example, I, I grew up working with my parents, but my experience is very different to that of a street vendor, right? I never claim to, to know what it is to be a street vendor. And I'm very clear, up, clear about being reflexive when I conducted my study, because at the end of the day, I, I, I left the site. At the end of the day, I was a US citizen. At the end of the day, I was a graduate student doing my research. So I am very aware of my position and my privilege in the field. And I think for young researchers, that's really important to acknowledge. But I'm very proud that the book towards the end, uh, especially when I've been presenting it in conferences, people can relate to the stories because of the human element of the family component of what it means to uh, uh, make a living together, what it means to protect each other, right? What it means to have this economic empathy, what it means to have different uneven resources and how you can share them. So I think if we um, if we start by there, by not othering, by not othering um, people from for what they do, by eliminating the stigma, because again, as I as I show, these children have a lot of skills, uh, a lot of uh, you know um, skills that they've accumulated through their work. But again, they remain invisible because of the stigma and the illegality attached to street vending, right? So, I mean, from local things that we can do is continue to, to encourage um, the legalization of street vending in Los Angeles. Um, there's organizations that are directly working with, with, um, with, uh, with this, ELAG, LEARN, uh, and others in Los Angeles that are, um, that are working to, to help street, vending, uh, street vendors and, and decriminalize it. Um, so by supporting them, it's, it's one way. Another is by, and this is just me as a, as a, as a, uh, a student at one point who benefited from scholarships. Um, maybe if you can put a two in the chat, if you've ever benefited from a scholarship or some type of financial aid, uh, through further your education, can you put a two in the chat? I want, I'm, I'm curious to see who remains here. Um, two for sure. Right. Um, I think that's really important. And one of my commitments, and I, I write about this in the book as in, in a footnote, it's not, uh, it's not a main thing, but, um, um, I shared, uh, what I, that I've been, I, part of what I do in, in my teaching is, is I, I use art as a tool to, uh, tap into my, my students, uh, immigration story, right. For them to create a piece of art and then talk about their immigration narrative, immigration story, and what that means. Um, and what I've been fortunate enough to do is um, I sell my art, and 100% of what I earn goes to a scholarship for street vending youth and DACA youth. I think that's a very direct way of benefiting um, uh, the community that gave me so much uh, in terms of sharing their stories with me. Uh, my goal is for this um, for this scholarship to grow and be beyond um, anything that I can do myself and encourage other artists to donate and give back in forms of scholarships. So I think that 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 helping in that way is also a very positive um, way of changing people's lives, right? Because again, all of the youth that I interviewed, they want to be uh, police officers, they want to be uh, teachers, they want to be attorneys. And they want to do that because they want to give back to their community. So if we help them and achieve their goal, um, and that's that could be uh, one granito de arena that we can put towards helping um, uh, not not uh, families, but helping uh, the youth achieve their own um, educational goals. Dr. Estrada, thank you so much for joining us at The Matrix. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I'm so grateful that you were able to uh, provide your knowledge to our students and we will be recording this or we have recorded it and we will be posting it on our website so that you can share it with friends and we will be uh, informing the rest of the campus once that's done. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here and I appreciate the invitation.
Have a wonderful Monday. And thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Mora. Thank you.